All right, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, um, and I'm uh, going to be host, and I'll be speaking tonight about artificial intelligence. There's uh, two roles the college. One is no personal attacks, and the other one is uh, no, uh, one fool no personal one attacks fool at and time. one fool at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Format. The format consists of the following. First, well, speaker will speak for about an hour. Then we're going to have our uh, question and answer period. We'd like to have questions during that time because you'll have a chance later on to do rebuttals, which means you'll be able to rebut yourself later on. And after that, uh, after I, we are question and answer, we'll all a, set a certain allotted amount of time. You'll be able to uh, do rebuttals and uh, we have to leave here about 7.45. And if you guys would like to stay on Zoom, we can allot a, another host to do so. All right, now that we're gonna start the se session, I'm done setting because I'm gonna be speaking tonight about artificial intelligence, but let's, if anybody has announcements for uh, the community, let us know so that we can uh, get going. All right, Charlie, I'm gonna share screen on the- uh, oh, Tim? Yes. Remind them that there's a $3 tuition charge. All right. There is a $3 tuition charge for you guys here who are in it. It helps defray college expenses. And there, there, when this restaurant does exist, doesn't exist for our health, they let us come in, but we would like to see that you guys do a food and drink purchase here to help support the restaurant and help uh, have us kept welcome to come here. So with that all being said, uh, Charlie, if you are right. ready to uh, start announcements go ahead yeah let's see the screen share tim okay welcome everyone to meeting number 3714 of the college of complexes the playground for people who think as usual i begin with a uh notice please we have a google email group and a meetup group as well i highly recommend you subscribe to either one or both of those almost no traffic except one or two notices of what the upcoming program is going to be each week so those two groups right in the center top of our website you can do it in less than a minute i recommend that okay uh, now another thing during the presentation uh there's two things if you're attending by zoom please put a red x the red X over the microphone, so as not to disturb the presenter. And if you're in attendance in the restaurant, please refrain from side conversations, at least during the presentation, because they are picked up uh, by the microphones. So thank you for your cooperation in this regard. Though, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On May the 6th, it's our annual May Day celebration. And we've got a special guest, Fred Kirshner. Uh, he's gonna tell us about, he was he was raised by a, in a communist family. And it's got some interesting stories. And he says, May Day is the best day of the year to celebrate. May the 6th, May Day. May 13th, this is an interesting topic. I've heard it already. Marilyn's from our other satellite campus and she wants e economic democracy. This is very interesting. Please be quiet in the restaurant. Thank you. Economic democracy on May 13th. This one has generated a lot of conversation, I guarantee you. Good talk. May 20th, our own Jonathan Barton, he wants to arrest any number of individuals and try them for war crimes. Uh, he feels that they are guilty. He wants to put them before the tribunal of the International Criminal Court. So we'll see what he has to say in this regard. On May the 27th, a college regular long time, Mike Lehman is going to show us all about high-speed trains. 
He took a trip to Europe, went from London under the tube. So if you want to learn about the very latest in high-speed travel, I highly recommend it. He's got, I think he said he's got a hundred slides. So it should be pretty, pretty good program. Easy. Now we have three open dates presently in June, the third, 17th, and 24th. And if you haven't spoken before, I would like to talk. I'd like to fill these dates. So let me know and we'll get you booked. And then on June the 10th, Henrik is having a friend Henry uh, from Eastern Europe. He's an author with a blog. He's got all kinds of articles he's been writing over the years, uh, occasionally at the college. Um, but his is, is Zappic is going to be the Ukraine and worldwide peace. He's got some selections here, some selections you can read in advance and see uh, what his views are in this regard. But the topic is going to be the Ukraine. Now, one last thing, we maintain two archival sites. Uh, we maintain a lecture library of YouTube videos. And we don't want to get thrown off YouTube because we've got 10, Tim has put in 10 years of work or more recording videos and posting them. But there's recordings of all the past, almost all of the past lectures uh, that you can look at in your leisure. Also, there's another site, uh, I call it a, uh, a listing of PowerPoints and, and recommended films. So there's the PowerPoints that were shown during the presentations are posted there, as well as uh, documentaries or films, free and online that you can look at uh, relevant to topics. So, and there you can see the time and so forth, uh, a variety of things. Uh, in addition, that supplement lectures. Okay, sir, thank you very much. Take it away. All right. Okay, Charlie, I guess uh, we'll do what I call my uh, thing and uh, welcome Tim Bulger to the College of Complexes. All right. The first thing you're going to probably wonder about is what exactly is artificial intelligence? Well, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about it. I'm going to give a message of what it is not. And then we're going to get into some demonstrations of what exactly Chat GPT is and what it can do. Uh, I have an account with them. And then uh, after that, we'll do a little bit about is Chat GPT and artificial intelligence going to take this, this computer? It is going to become self-aware, so it's going to be a good night. As soon as I get my PowerPoint up here, we'll be uh, ready to go in just a second or two here, if you'll just bear with me for a minute. Uh, it's going to take a second here to get this. Uh, I am running a laptop that's very slow right now, so please just bear with me while it gets up. And I'd like to welcome you. Artificial intelligence. Let me tell you a little bit about it while this thing's coming up. Um, it's basically uh, it's basically going on a speech or a presentation or helping you get assistance with uh, doing many items and things. All right, I've now got my presentation up. We're now going to uh, share screen on this thing and uh, we will get started here in just a second. Okay, and uh, sorry about the delay here. I should have had a little, a little, a little everything ready here, okay? All right, now, are computers becoming self-aware and are they gonna take your jobs? This is the topic we're gonna to talk about tonight with artificial intelligence. The first thing I wanna do and let you know is, what is exactly artificial intelligence? 
While artificial intelligence refers to the development of computer systems that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, such as learning, problem solving, decision making, and perception. AI is a multidisciplinary field that combines computer science, mathematics, psychology, and neuroscience to create intelligence machines that can mimic human behavior and thought processes. AI systems use algorithms, statistical models, and large amounts of data to analyze and recognize patterns, learn from past experiences, and make predictions about future outcomes. These systems can be trained to perform specific tasks such as image recognition, natural language processing, game playing, and can prove their performance over time through feedback and continuous learning. Yes, computers can learn on their own. It's called machine learning. What can AI be used for? Well, it has a lot of real world applications, inc including in healthcare, finance, transportation, education, and entertainment. AI has the potential to revolutionary, revolutionize these industries for automating repetitive tasks, improving accuracy and efficiency, and enabling new forms of innovation and creativity. And you know, let's put it this way. Of course, it can also do speeches like this one, which I extensively used, and especially one called ChatGPT for some suggestions for these PowerPoint presentations. Many of the explanations were generated by AI. And don't forget too, it can also be used for new forms of propaganda and entertainment. The next question is, how does AI work versus traditional computing? Traditional computing involves using a set of instructions to manipulate data and produce an output. The program can be written, is written by a human and operates on a fixed set of rules that are predefined by the programmer. In contrast, AI involves creating algorithms that can learn from data and make decisions based on data without explicitly being programmed. AI systems use large amounts of data to train algorithms and improve their performance over time. For example, a computer-based, a computer vision system can be trained to recognize objects and images by feeding it thousands of labeled exercises. As a system exposed to more data, it can improve its accuracy and learn to recognize more complex human patterns. The heart of the concept is this. AI is different from traditional computing because it can adapt to new situations and make decisions based on the data it has been trained on. In contrast, traditional computing systems are limited by the rules and logic that they have been programmed into them. AI has the potential to automate many tasks that were previously done by humans, such as data analysis, decision making, and customer service. AI can also uncover new insights and patterns in data that would be difficult or impossible to humans to find on their own. And yes, it can also help to automate speech making, which is what I use ChatGPT for. We will get into that in a little bit later on because that'll be the fun part once we get through the basic concepts and some of the uh, gist of what AI is. There's a number of types of artificial intelligence. The first one is called rules-based AI, which is the most basic type. These systems are programs with a set of rules and instructions and decision trees to make decisions based on specific inputs. For example, an expert system that diagnoses medical conditions can be used on patient symptoms it uses a rule-based approach. The second part is machine learning. Machine learning involves training algorithms to learn patterns and make predictions based on data without being explicitly programmed. The system uses our statistical models to learn from data and improve its performance over time. There are three types of machine learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And then there's deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning that involves training neural networks with multiple layers to recognize data. In short, the algorithms are programmed that they can learn themselves. Once I get this advanced, it will be all, oh, come on. It's, uh, I'm having a little trouble here again, uh, advancing. So give me just a minute here while I, uh, okay. 
uh, give me a second here. Okay, what can AI be used for? Well, the first thing is, is in healthcare, AI is used to develop new drugs, improve diagnosis and treatment of diseases and manage medical records. AI powered diagnostic systems are used to analyze medical images and detect early signs of disease. Second, finance. AI can be used to detect fraud, predict market trends, personalized financial service. Banks and institutions are also using chatbots to improve customer service. <clears throat> Transportation. AI is being used to develop self-driving cars, improve traffic flow, and optimize logistics and supply chain management. Basically, it's gonna help us get around a little easier. In the retail sector, AI is being used to improve personalized product recommendations, optimize inventory management, and improve customer service. In education, it's being used to develop personalized learning systems. Meaning, for example, a special ed kid could now have a program customized to him without all the benefit of a lot of teachers. It can provide feedback to students and then automate a lot of the administrative tasks that teachers are now using. And then, of course, AI is being used to develop new forms of entertainment, such as virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. There are some advantages to AI. It's efficiency, it can automate repetitive and time consuming tasks, improve efficiency and productivity. This can free up time for humans to focus on more complex and creative tasks. Two is accuracy. AI can systems can process large amounts of data quickly and accurately, reducing the risk of errors and improving decision-making. Personalization, AI can be used to personalize products and services based on individual preferences and behaviors. This can lead to better customer experiences and increased customer loyalty. Cost savings, AI can reduce tools, costs by automating tests that were previously done by users, such as data, data entry and customer service. Speed, AI print systems can produce large amounts of data, entering faster decision-making and problem solving. Scalability, AI systems can easily scale up or down depending upon the needs of the business, making it easier to adapt to market changing conditions. And then of course, innovation, which can be used to uncover new insights, new patterns, and maybe be out create the creators sometimes. Now there are some challenges to artificial intelligence because Remember, it is programmed by a human. AI systems can be biased if they are trained on biased data. This can result in unfair or discriminatory outcomes. AI systems can collect and process large amount of data. That's also raising concerns about privacy and security. Regulation, the use of AI raises regulatory issues, including questions about liability, responsibility, and accountability. If you're an artist, for example, and you have a work, you go into an image generating AI, produce a work from this artist that is like this artist, well, in a sense, you're using that artist's work. But this is a somewhat murky area of, of a copyright law that's right now being litigated in the courts. And believe me, it may, it can stop a lot of this stuff cold. Job displacement, here's the big one. The AI, the use of AI, has the potential to automate many jobs, which could lead to job displacement and the need for retraining and resolving. In other words, much like the Luddites were in the Victorian times, AI has the same type of uh, market disruptment that we have seen in, in the past. I mean, we've just seen it recently in the last 20 years with the introduction of the internet and a lot of the uh, white color jobs and blue color jobs being automated. But a lot of times too, you get more into create more creative aspects. Ethical considerations, the use of AI raises ethical questions about the role of humans in decision-making and the potential of misuse of AI technology. For example, you know, your credit score today is largely determined by AI. You know, how you pay your bills, how you do things. And a lot of times it's not even reviewed by a human, but you assign a credit score. That's now being done by artificial intelligence, as well as a, a lot of intelligent algorithms. As long as you have a human that can override the system, take into account the, maybe some special needs of a creditor. Maybe he uh, went bankrupt from a business before, but he paid off all his bills. 
I know I've hit it something new, he might be a good risk. But that can only be made by a human being and not a computer program. Um, AI systems can be complex and difficult to understand, making it the challenge to determine how they make decisions. As a matter of fact, some of the people behind what they call open AI are shocked as to how fast some of these uh, new algorithms are learning. Um, technical limitations, I can have technical limitations, um, such as the ability to handle complex reasoning, which can limit the effectiveness in certain applications. What does the future hold for artificial intelligence? Well, first of all, increased automation. As AI systems become more sophisticated, there's a potential for increased automation of tasks in certain industries, including manufacturing, transportation, and healthcare. Think like self-driving trucks, automated ports, large warehouses where humans don't have to uh, actually pack and ship boxes, but it's all done by a machine and computer and robots. Improved decision-making. AI systems can be used to augment human decision-making, providing insights and recommendations to inform more informed and effective decision-making. In other words, they're not making the decisions, but they can provide a much better in-depth look at the data. Advancements in natural language processing. What this means is that, can I get the computer to talk to you in your language that you can understand it? Natural language processing involves technology that could continue to improve, enabling more advanced human-like communication between humans and machines. And of course, it also means advancements in robotics, um, improved healthcare outcomes, and of course, enhanced cybersecurity, meaning that it'll be a lot harder to do things. However, I'm gonna give you a warning about AI. The development and deployment of AI technology also raises ethical and social implications that need to be addressed. As AI technology continues to advance, it will be important to ensure that it is developed and used in a responsible and ethical manner. This will require ongoing collaboration between policymakers, developers, and other stakeholders to establish guidelines and regulation that promote safe and ethical use of AI technology. So are computers actually becoming self-aware? Well, at present, there's really no evidence to suggest that computers are becoming self-aware. AI systems are becoming self-aware in the same way that in the same way that humans are not. While AI systems are capable of performing complex tasks and making decisions based on data and algorithms, they do not have consciousness or subjective experience. The concept of self-awareness is closely tied to the idea of consciousness, which remains a mystery to science. While there is ongoing research into the development of artificial consciousness, it remains largely a theoretical approach at this time. So are they becoming more aware? It is important to note that AI systems can be programmed to mimic like human-like behavior, including emotions and responses to certain stimuli. However, this, there is a programmed response rather than a reflection of true consciousness or self-awareness. While it is unlikely that computers or AI systems will become self-aware in the near future, advances in AI technology will continue to bring new capabilities and applications across a wide range of industries. As AI technology evolves, it will be important to consider the ethical and social implications of its use to ensure that it is developed in a responsible and ethical manner. Will a computer take my job? It is at risk of being automated. Some jobs may actually benefit from the use of AI technology. For example, AI can be used to augment human decision-making, providing insights and recommendations, and automate repetitive or dangerous tasks. To prepare for the future of work, it is important for individuals to develop skills that are complementary to AI technology, such as critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving. Additionally, governments and organizations can take steps to promote learning. Now, what do you do when you have a theory of rapid change? You must adapt to the market. You're constantly being, maybe my job might go, maybe something else. Well, I remember 
back in 2006, when I uh, was saw a book rip, rip, when I was actually at the, it was in Washington DC at the National Book Review Show. And I saw Thomas Friedman review his book. It was called, I'm sorry, the name's escaping me right now. Oh, The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century. And during the question and answer period, he was asked by one of the questioners, what is it you can do to help yourself not get uh, out of a job? And he says, well, if there's something that you're interested in and that you know a lot about, whether it be a hobby or a skill, he says, make sure you take your courses on it. Make sure you're good at it. Make sure you enjoy what you're learning about because that is the most effective way to do so. He said, love to learn. If you, you know, and find first find your passion, follow it. As it says in the book of uh, Proverbs, see the man who was skilled at his work, he will sit before kings. The second most asked question he's often about is, well, what about my kids? What are they going to learn about? How are they going to be able to compete in this new world of constant change and AI and everything else? He then said, have your kids learn good teachers. Have them learn from teachers who can, uh, are passionate about their subject. Have them take an online course. And he said, there are so many more resources, as well as us learning about the web and about AI. What There's a lot more out there. And now this will be the end of the formal presentation here, but I'm gonna now get into the demonstration part. First off, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I wrote this speech, my own feelings about AI and a demonstration Demonstration of one of the tools that's publicly available right now that anybody can learn. And that is called Chat GPT. What I'm going to do right now is, as I'm working on this, I'm going to try myself now to uh, boot up a Chat GPT session and do it. First off, I must say, this speech, after immersing myself in well over two weeks of the subject matter by watching a lot of YouTube videos, um, getting on my computer and playing around. I became very aware of what this subject is and what it does. And it, folks, is going to work some miracles. But at the same time, the potential for abuse is also big. You know, you have Elon Musk right now warning about it, that we got to put the thing on pause because we have stuff. You know, chat GPT, is just one of the things that works on words and suggestions and uh, things like this. And we'll be getting deep into that too. But now AI can be used to generate videos from text, make speeches, make, make an avatar talk. Uh, and, and, it can, and some people have even produced a whole movie. I'm gonna show you one of the first computer generated AI commercials that were for uh, public use. As soon as I share my screen here, we'll be uh, on it. And it's the one of the Republican commercials that were basically put out just a few hours after Joe Biden announced his candidacy. As soon as I get my share screen to work here, we'll have it up and here, here we go. So we got Google up and I'm just gonna put uh, Republican. And as you know, Google already in its in infancy was never really AI. It just was a was a uh, thing that uh, was able to do it. Now what we're going to do is uh, show you a short four minute. Uh, video, it's gonna have the commercial inside of it, I think, if I can remember here at all. Um, I just need to find the actual commercial here real quick because I had it up. Uh, I think here, uh, I can find it here real quick. All right, here we go. We can pull this up, now we'll be all set. Like I said, I am running a, a slow internet connection, so it's gonna take a minute to pull up, but, uh, as you know, 
this commercial is basically was all generated by artificial intelligence, meaning that it was able to, okay, I think uh, this will be a, just have to wait a minute for the algorithm to kick in. I, we are using a somewhat slow public connection here with the uh, Wi-Fi, so we're going to try to uh, get it up if I can. I, I apologize, friends. It is loading a little slow, but now I think we got it. Okay, hang on here. We'll have it open and full screen in a second here once it, once it keep, kicks in. Yeah, and this is what this, what you'll see. Chat GPT is a little faster because it's a web-based program and text. All right, here we go. And we can now call the 2024 presidential race for Joe Biden. The Republican Party have released a... This is good. He's going to have a little commentary, but it'll, it'll come up in, a, in about a minute or two. Wild AI-generated political ad in response to Joe Biden announcing his run for re-election. So I'm going to show you this ad. It is just, it, honestly, when I first watched it, I laughed out loud at how ridiculous <laughs> the entire thing is. But it's right in line with what these people do. First, let me show you how quickly here Biden's announcement on Twitter. I'm not going to play the video. It's three minutes long, but it's a video. I'll link to it below if you care to watch it. Joe Biden right in here, or at least his campaign team right here. Explain a little more Every generation has a moment where they have had to stand up for democracy, to stand up for their fundamental freedoms. I believe this is ours. That's why I'm running for re-election as president of the United States. Join us. Let's finish the job. Now, uh, Axios broke the story about the, uh, the, the first look at the AI-generated ad, writing that the RNC has produced this video that is 100% AI, according to a spokesperson. Let's check it out. This just in, we can now call the 2024 presidential race for Joe Biden. This morning, an involved in China invades Taiwan. Financial markets are in free fall as 500 regional banks have shuttered their doors. Border agents were overrun by a surge of 80,000 illegals yesterday. The shows closed the city of San Francisco this morning, hiding the escalating crime and fentanyl crisis. Who's in charge here? It feels like the train is coming off the tracks. Okay. I laughed again. That was wonderful. So absolutely ridiculous. Let me go over what they... Okay, I think you guys get the idea of what AI generated ads can be. They did this within an hour of having Joe Biden, um, having Joe Biden's announcement. Everything was automated and they had it posted within less than an hour. Well, normally it would take a guy like me maybe a day to do something like this, edit it up and all that stuff. This stuff's gonna be powerful. This stuff's gonna be really intense. That's just a small taste of what's coming ahead. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, go into what we call Chat GPT, which is the uh, AI, the, the current AI program that I've been using for quite a while. As soon as I can uh, get it up here, we'll be all set. Um, as I've got it, I just got to get the uh, right thing here. Okay, got to log in. All right. To get uh, open AI, okay, to get AI, it's pretty easy. Uh, you just go, and let me see, I got to get this on Zoom here. I'm sorry about this. You know, sometimes we have the te technology that, that, that doesn't really help us sometimes, but we got it. Okay, here we go. All right. As you can see, we got a web browser open. All you really have to do is go to the following link, chat.openai.com. There will be a, you'll have to register an email address and link, but I've got several uh, queries that I've already been done on here. First of all, what does AI have to say about the college of complexes? Entering a query. Uh, I'll just basically, once upon a time, there was a small college in the heart of a bustling city. The college was called the College of Complexes. It was unlike any institution of higher learning in the world. At the College of Complexes, students did not study traditional academic subjects like math or literature. Instead, they explored the most complex and controversial ideas of the day. Tackling the subjects are often considered taboo in polite society. 
the cult College of Complexes has a unique approach to education. Every week they would invite a guest speaker to come and give a guest lecture on a controversial topic. The topics were ranged from politics to religion to sex and drugs. No subject with off limits, and speakers were encouraged to express their views free freely. Anyway, it goes on. The students of the College of Complexes were an eclectic bunch. They came from all walks of life and all corners of the world. Some were young and idealistic, eager to challenge the status quo and explore new ideas. Others were older and more world weary, looking for new perspectives on the complex issues that had defined their lives. Despite their differences, the students of the College of Complexes shared a common goal to explore the most complex and controversial ideas of the day and to challenge their own assumptions and biases in the process. Over time, the College of Complexes became known as a haven for free speech and intellectual exploration. It is a place where people could come together and engage in lively, respectful debate on some of the most pressing issues today. And while not everyone agreed with everything that was said at the College of Complexes, everyone respected the rights of others to express their views. In many ways, the College of Complexes was a microcosm in a larger world. It was a place where people from all walks of life could come together and engage in meaningful dialogue, even when they didn't agree. And in a world that often seemed divided by hate and intolerance, the of complex is a shining example of what could be achieved when people came together in, in openness and mutual respect. Now, a lot of times, you know, we can go into stuff with chat GPT. Now I'm gonna start here a new chat. Who has got a difficult question that they would like to answer? Are the vaccines killing us? Are the all right, we're going to put this in a chat GPT and I'll tell you exactly what it's going to do. Tim, that may be problematic. Well, watch what to watch, watch the uh, watch to watch the thing. No, the vaccines are not killing us. COVID 19 vaccines have been developed and authorized for emergency use by health regulatory authorities worldwide and are undergoing rigorous clinical trials to ensure that they are safe and prevent and effective in preventing COVID-19. Millions of people have already been vaccinated. And while there have been reports of adverse reactions, the vast majorities have been mild and temporary, such as soreness at the injection site, fatigue and headaches. Serious adverse effects are rare and are closely monitored and investigated by public health authorities. The benefits of getting vaccinated against COVID-19 far outweigh the risks. Vaccines are one of the most effective tools to help protect ourselves from our, and our communities from the spread of COVID-19 and its potential severe health consequences. It is important to consult with a trusted healthcare provider to address any concerns or questions you may have about the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, who's got another question? Why don't they tell the other side of the story? Huh? Um, Oh, okay, we'll do who did. How about another topic altogether? Well, how good are the labor laws in the United States? Let's take a look, Charlie. Oh, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get that. How good are the labor laws in the United States? All right, where as you can see, it's generating there and there and there. All right, I'll see if we can uh, do a voice to text on this one. But uh, the labor laws of the United States are complex and cover a wide range of issues, including minimum wage, overtime, pay, workplace safety, discrimination, and the right to unionize. The effectiveness of these laws in protecting workers' rights and ensuring fair treatment varies on a variety of factors. Overall, some experts believe that the labor laws in the United States are not as strong as those in other developed countries, particularly in terms of protecting workers' rights to unionize and collectively bargain for better wages and working conditions. Additionally, some workers in the United States are exempt from certain labor protections, such as those in the gig economy and those working as independent contractors. However, there have been recent efforts to strengthen labor laws in the United States including proposals to raise minimum wage and expand worker protections in industries such as health care and transportation. Ultimately, the effectiveness of labor laws in the United States 
depends upon specific laws and regulations in place, as well as they support enforced by government agencies and the courts. All right, Raj, you got a question? Raj. Okay, Raj, go ahead. Raj, I think you're on mute. Raj. Okay, okay. What, what, uh, Kelvin, you wanna do one, Raj? Well, we'll get- Yeah. Who put the bop in the bop shoe up shoe up? Who put the ram in the ram and lama ding dong? Uh, uh, How about something about Ukraine? Okay, what what would you like specifically to know, Raj? Do you have your question? Is, is the U Ukraine U U Ukraine the war in Ukraine appropriate? Is the war in Ukraine? A hang on. Okay. Is the war in Ukraine appropriate? All right, Chat GPT. Let's see what it says. So hopefully we get something in there. I'll have to do a new chat on that one. Sorry about that. Oh, it's I have to get a new chat in there. Is the war in Ukraine appropriate? Okay, is the war in Ukraine appropriate? As an AI language model, it is not within my capability to determine what is appropriate or not, as that is subjective judgment that depends on one's perspective and values. However, it is important to note that the conflict in Ukraine is a complex issue that involves political, social, and historical factors. It began in 2014 when the pro-Russian government of Ukraine was overthrown and Russia annexed Crimea Peninsula was part of Ukraine. The conflict escalated into a violent war between Ukrainian government forces and Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine. The war has caused significant loss of life and displacement in civilians and has resulted in ongoing tensions between Russia, Ukraine and Russia. You know, All right, motherfucker. So a couple of weeks ago, I shot the fucking dog that lives across the way. Um, little barking ass motherfucker was on top of the goddamn balcony. He wouldn't shut the fuck up. You feel me? And I had to drop my nigga. I had to put him the fuck down. You feel me? We removed, we removed him. He's been removed. Uh, and that's going to happen. And that sometimes AI can also be used to that to do that too if you have to. Um, anyway, Raj, you got your head. You said you had a question. Okay. All right. Uh, Raj, you want to ask a question? Go ahead and unmute. Raj, we can't hear you. Want to check your microphone, Raj? I've got a question. Charlie, I'm going to. Should AI be used to hire Charlie. among applicants, choose among applicants for a job? We'll look at that in a minute, because uh, I got one from the audience here, and it's why do some cultures periodically forgive all debts? Let's try that one. Okay. Why do some cultures periodic? Okay. Sorry about that. that was... Um. Okay. Uh. Dude, I think I lost my. I just lost my. Uh... In some cultures, it is seen as a way of promoting social harmony and reducing economic inequality. In ancient societies, that was often viewed as a burden that could lead to social unrest and conflict. To prevent this, some societies introduced instituted debt forgiveness laws 
that allowed debtors to start anew without being burdened by past debts. These laws are, were often tied to religious spiritual beliefs that emphasize the importance of forgiveness and compassion. In some modern societies, periodic debt forgiveness is still practiced. For example, some religious groups, such as the Jewish community, observe the tradition of the sabbatical year or I am sorry, it, 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 it cut off there. But anyway, you know, if, what else we got? Uh, we also have uh, bankruptcy. Okay, uh, Charlie, you said what? What? What is you? What was your question, Charlie? Uh, well, can AI be used to help me cho who to choose, who I should hire from among a number of applicants? Okay, can AI be helpful to choose for job applicants? Yes, AI can be helpful in the job application process. Here are a few, a few ways AI can help. One is resume screening. All AI employed software can analyze resumes and cover letters to identify key college qualifications and experience that match the job requirements. This can save the recruiters a lot of time and help them identify the most promising candidates. Free employment assessment. AI. You fail me? I couldn't give a damn. I whip my yeah, fucking yeah. cock out and I piss up on that oh, fucking yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because I want more, motherfucker. I'm hungry. I want to become a motherfucker. Oh, lonely, sad fucker. Go best. I'll look out some dude. They got him removed. I'm sorry, guys. I'm having to do it. Who is behind those trolls? Uh, the trolls are just guys who logged in. I let That's them. Uh, uh, no, they just went in and they, uh, they're, they're, they're trying, they're trying to, uh, virtually enter the meeting, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I'll read the answer, please. Okay. Um, it, it can also be used as for pre-employment assessment, AI based pre-employment assessments can evaluate job applicants on various skills and abilities such as problem solving critical thinking cognitive ability and personality traits this can provide more accurate and objective evaluations of job applicants and reduce the risk of bias hiring decisions virtual with candidates and ask relevant questions to assess their skills and experience. This can save time and resources for a recruiting team and provide a more convenient and efficient experience in job applicants. Predictive analytics. AI can analyze past hiring data and job performance data to identify the best candidates for specific job roles. This can help recruiters predict candidates that are most likely to be successful in a particular role and make more informed hiring decisions. However, it's important to remember that AI should not be the sole decision maker in the hiring process. It should be used to assist human recruiters. It should be used to assist human recruiters and ensure they have access to the most relevant and accurate data to make informed decision. Additionally, it's crucial to ensure that AI powered hiring tools are designed and used ethically to avoid perpetuating biases or discrimination. Can, can it be used to, how can it be misused to, in job applications? Well, I think Would it you can, ask it that? How can chat GPT be misused to screen out politically targeted candidates, politically inconvenient whistleblowers? Okay. How could chat be TBT be used to, to misuse to screen job applicants? All right, here's your answer. All right. 
fucking taking nigga $110 of my hard earned fucking money. It's fucking please outside. Dickhead. I've got them all so far. I think I'm just not going to let anybody else say it unless I know the name. Um. Anyway, well, there's your. There's your. I'm going to see if I can get this. Well, I'm going to see right now if I can use a, a text to voice generator because I'm getting a little hoarse here. Okay. Text to voice generator, and we'll see what we can use here. And uh, you know, the thing is, this this stuff is incredible. What you can do with it. We're doing going back into Google now, and uh, there's a lot of uh, things. The one that's uh, free text to speech online with realistic AI voices. Okay, we have this. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna show you what we can do. Uh, we'll do uh, we'll do Jane. I still get nightmares. In fact, I get them so. Let sunshine is to flowers, smiles are to humanity. These are but trifles. That's the wrong one. I'm going to have to go to a. I'm going to have to go to another one. Uh, text to speech on. Oh, uh, there's there's one that I know of. It's going to take a minute to. Uh, okay, here we go. Well, this this is this is one that I've used. I think I've. I've used this in the past. I think it's a. Sometimes these guys only give you uh, something here. Uh, and this one's free, so we'll be able to use it. I'm there with me for a minute. We get it up and running. Uh, okay. Uh, come on, come on. Oh, this is a. We're going to go to one that I know real well. I've got, I've, got, I've got one bookmark here that we can probably get to real quick. Um, there we go. Well, there's a lot of stuff. The text to voice generators have been around for a while. Text to speech robot. Okay, here we go. All right, we'll uh, take the uh, new chat. We'll put it in here. And we'll, uh, we'll put it down in here. Take our text. As I get it. As soon as I can get it copied, we'll go here, put it here, paste it, I think, paste. Oh, come on. Okay. All right. And then we'll uh, use UK English. And we'll uh, and take a minute here. Word file. No, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to take a minute here, though. Some of these might not be working, and with the slow internet connection, it might take a minute or two to uh, do things. But, uh, you know, it's oh, come on. As an AI language model, ChatGPT could be misused to screen job applicants in a biased or discriminatory manner if it is not used properly. Here are a few potential ways that ChatGPT could be misused. Biased training data. If the training data used to train chat GPT is biased or incomplete, the model may develop biased or incomplete insights that could negatively impact the screening process. Lack of transparency. If recruiters do not understand how chat GPT is making its decisions, they may not be able to assess whether the model is being used ethically and appropriately. Over-reliance on AI. If recruiters rely too heavily on chat GPT to screen job applicants, they may overlook important information that could impact hiring decisions. To ensure that chat GPT is not misused in the job screening process, it's important to use unbiased and diverse training data. Ensure that the data used to train chat GPT is diverse and representative of the job applicant pool. Establish clear criteria. Establish clear criteria for job applicants and ensure that chat G
ChatGPT is used to augment human decision making rather than replace it. Monitor ChatGPT's performance. Continuously monitor ChatGPT's performance to identify and correct any biases or errors in its screening process. Be transparent. Ensure that recruiters understand how ChatGPT is making its decisions and are able to evaluate the model's performance in an open and transparent manner. Well, I know that was a typical one, but I'll uh, let's go back to ChatGPT again. Who else? Go ahead, uh, ask a question. Would you repeat that, please, and come up? I have a question. Okay. All right. Who are you? I am Dan. I don't know to, I'm, I'm going to ask this a chat. Oh. Uh, this is insane. No. Okay. Give me a minute, please. What are you? Do you have a conscience? How do you spell conscience? S C I C O N S. Okay. All right, we're going to try this one now. Now we're probably going to have to get a new chat. We're going to have to dump this one here. I'm going to delete that one. I don't know why he keeps well the thing is I think he, he logged in under another name it's uh you know we're having trouble with the phone uh, all right anyway um you know but like i said you know uh our, our tt and know her she'll be all right well anyway um i think you're getting the uh the essence of what chat gpt is now we're going to just is that troll artificial intelligence uh, no, it's not. It's not artificial intelligence. Well, some of that stuff is, but uh, they have still have a human behind it who made it. And uh, okay. I just did. What are you? Do you have a conscience? Okay. Let's try. I'm going to try this other voice generator here. I know. I'm going to put it into a. Uh, I'm going to put it into uh, well, come on. Okay. I am an AI language model, specifically model designed by OpenAI, trained to process natural language inputs and generate natural language outputs. I do not have a conscience or subjective experiences like humans do, as I am a machine program. Oh, how do I get them in here? All right. Everybody, come on down now. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I think I think you guys get the idea. Experiences like humans. All right. Anyway, um, I'm going to close out the uh, chat GPT. Stop the share. And what I'm going to do now is uh, take your questions about AI and anything else, and then if not, we'll go into rebuttal. Right. Um. Can we have quiet from the restaurant? Oh, Charlie, they're, they're, they're cool. They've been well behaved, Charlie. No, we're, we're picking him up, Tim. Okay, anyway, um, all right, who's got questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I 
my own thing is that uh, I'll I'll show you. It can be a force for good because last night I'm thinking about this. Uh, he's gonna. That's our troll again. I think I'm just gonna keep. Gonna have to keep removing him from the thing. No, it's he's he's used several different names so far, and this is where a good example of using subjective intelligence and human intelligence is uh, far overrules the uh, Zoom thing because they can come in under a false name or something else, you know. And um, you know we've had several people come in with this stuff. You know, for example, I know almost everybody here on the Zoom screen right now. Uh, you know, see, and it's just like he's just. He's going to keep persisting until we come in. I don't think we have anybody, uh, you know, but that's what that's what I said. You know, sometimes I could let him in, but we'll probably have another troll in about two minutes or so. Yeah. You know, that's but that, they have well, the, the, the thing is, we have a waiting room in the Zoom. I usually let him in just as a matter of default, and then I eject him right away. But like I said, you know, Zoom does that so that they, you don't get unauthorized people in. As a Zoom master, you have to stay on top of this stuff and keep it going. Now, Luke, I know, I, I sorry, I didn't get your question. Okay, oh yeah, that's right. You were asking me if it's a force for good or a force for evil. Yeah, sure, I Uh-huh. Right, I know. Okay. All right. It's just to repeat your question for the audience. Um, you're asking me whether I believe if Chat GPT is a force for good or a force for evil, and do I have certain um things with Elon? Do I have certain? I'm sorry. I'm I'm not getting a. I, I seem to keep uh, uh, being Timmy here. Um, personally, I think it's a neat thing to see. I've always um, liked when new technology comes out. And, uh, you know, and it, like I said, it can be used for good or for evil. Uh, what's it going to be used for? I think it's going to be used for both. Uh, and I go back because uh, with my Christian beliefs, God said all men are sinners. So they'll figure out a way to misuse it, especially in the political realm. There'll be a lot more effective tool in uh, making better propaganda, making things. You just saw a quick example of that with just a quick Republican commercial they did. But the thing is, these tools are getting more accessible and more easier to uh, do. Um, I could show you on the web right now, several models of President Obama, President Trump, Beavis and Butthead. There was one I remember where they had Beavis and Butthead doing a rap, a rap song. Uh, there was another one where uh, they had uh, Vladimir Putin talking and reciting the Declaration of Independence in his own voice. Um, and like I said too, in the form of like marketing, for example, and you have a, you have a question an avatar will pop up, usually a good looking woman of some kind, and she'll be able to answer your questions directly, much like I'm doing through a computer, and they're gonna call that more marketing customization. You know, we've already seen a lot of this stuff in the last 20 years already. I mean, if you look at the, the search engine Google, for example, I remember when it first came out because when the web was in its infancy, maybe one, two, three years old, it was kind of hard to find something. You know, you had Dogpile, Alta Vista, let Sergey Brin and Larry Page came up with a uh, way of uh, searching the web by what they called authority sites and uh, um, traffic sites. In other words, what they did was they had the sites that had the most links to other sites on them and the ones that had the most traffic to them. So they called the technology page rank and uh, page rank and um, authority. And they were able to combine the two into a very simple search engine, which basically revolutionized uh, stuff. Okay, Rod, you have a question. Uh, go ahead. Can you? Can we hear you now? 
Raj, we still can't hear you. Raj, you're unmuted, but you got to check your microphone on your computer. I think that might be why we're having trouble. Okay. Raj, you're now muted. Now, now try to unmute again and check your microphone. Okay. Well, we'll get it. All right, Raj, while you're trying to figure that out, Charlie, you have a question? Yes. How will this system be used to make somebody money? How are the capitalists going to exploit the system in order to enrich themselves, do you think? Uh, you know, I, I will, uh, if I went to YouTube, I think I could answer that question pretty quick. Um, Charlie's asking, how can the capitalists use AI to make money? Well, Charlie, guess what? Market segmentation. Take over the world. Marketing, market, mar you know, marketing to a specific groups. Um, Disinformers. They could, uh, they could also use it to, uh, you know, put more propaganda out about their product or service. Make a heck of a lot better commercial. Um, uh, you know. I can answer that. It'll, it, in other words, what it is, it's a more. It'll put the tools of commercial production, um, meaning that you could generate videos from text, you could generate content, code from ChatGPT, put it instantly into a website. Now, if you look around again at a lot of the things of ChatGPT, it specializes in generating code, okay? I'm gonna show you real quick a little bit. I'll go back online here because I do have some saved chats already that will uh, give you a good example of this real quick. And one of them, that's exactly right. But the thing is, what what we'll do here is, let's say we go back into a speech, uh, College of Complexes, there, that's the one that we had, no, it's not. Uh, here we go. This was a speech that I did with, with AI. And this is sort of what uh, I used to uh, help me write the speech. Um, and I just asked it, can you write a speech about artificial intelligence? And uh, look at what came out. I'm not going to read it because you guys can see that it was basically part of what I was reading earlier. And then I asked it later on, uh, you know, it just basically gave me a brief outline of the speech. And I, I've got a printout of that too. Um, can, it, can it be critical though? Speak critically about its own ability to um, use power. You know, I mean, I, I it can, honestly, it can I use, don't know. Use power. Um, Elon Musk. You know, Google. there, there's a lot of different things. Uh, they could lie to us. They could let us. Can know. we maintain some degree of order? Uh, Charlie. They can censor. Uh, 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 I, 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 I know. Do, but we can't. We can't talk about it. Well, can write a book. it can. It won't say gain a fund. And uh, it we'll can. It also uh, maintain. A lot of times, it maintains neutrality. You know. Um. Okay. Now, uh, did I answer your question, Charlie? Charlie. I sort of. I. I'd like to know how, like, multinational corporations are. How are they? Are they going to take over the media? They're going to take this over in any some fashion, and well, use it for profit reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, they could suspend the constitution. Okay, Harold. Okay, here we go. Oh. I, I wish people would let Tim answer the question. It would be appreciated. Yeah, okay, let's ask. Let's ask AI how it could do it. How can AI make money? AI has the potential to generate revenue and create new business opportunities in many ways. We're getting a quick list for you, Charlie, here. Developing and selling AI products and services. Companies can develop and sell AI-based products and services as chatbots, virtual assistants, and recommendation engines. AI can be used to improve operational efficiency, reduce costs, and increase productivity in industries such as manuring, 
manufacturing, transportation, and robotics, providing data analytics and insights. Uh, AI can be used to analyze large amounts of data and provide insights that can inform business decisions, enhancing customer experiences, developing new business models, and investing in AI technology. And if you really want to get into it, I could probably go back out to YouTube and ask it the same question. Could it be used to censor debate on vaccination? Uh, Can it be a, used to, is that a danger? Well, Does that a, make trillions of dollars for Pfizer? If, uh, they, if it, they censor all, all Ellen, the criticism Ellen, Oh, shut up. Ellen, you know, the it's thing. It's a danger. It's a very big. Ken, thing. hey, what's the all question? Right, Ellen, what Ellen, Ellen I'm, I'm asking that. Censor debate and science. It could be used yeah. to censor debate in science if, if you program it that way. The of the power elite. They can't, well, if they want Ellen, nuclear, they can get nuclear. If they censor anybody who talks about well, nuclear. Ellen, you know, Ellen, the thing is, is that, right uh, Ellen, would you, would, I'm asking you. I'm it, just helping you with the answer, okay? Capitalism, they, we've got a capital takeover of democracy. She's not I don't question is it. tonight. Uh, you know, uh, Ellen, we have been all trying to, to, to work, and I would just ask that you please refrain yourself a little bit, okay? We'll get, we'll have plenty of time during the rebuttal for you to speak at this point, okay? All right. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, Charlie, there's a lot of ways that AI can make money. If you really want to see what it can do, I'll just go to YouTube here. I'll just ask the search engine what we can do. And there's one called BARD, which can work, but I don't think we have uh, the time to, to get into it right now. If you just go to put into Google, for example, uh, uh, let's just say how AI benefits capitalism. Oh, I'm. How about another question? Can can a system be used for interpersonal relationships? Such as, should I go out on a date with a girl? How about how to court a woman, Charlie? I've just got yeah, whatever. I need some okay. advice. Well, we're going to give you some advice here as soon as it's uh, as soon as you get Chat GPT to work. As a language model, I am not qualified to provide professional relationship or dating advice. However, I can provide some general tips that may be helpful. Number one, be yourself. Authenticity is important in any relationship. Don't try to be someone you're not in order to impress someone. Two, show interest. Ask questions and act, listen actively to show that you are interested in getting to know in person. Respect boundaries. It is important to respect other people's boundaries and comfort level. Don't pressure someone into doing something they're not comfortable with. Be a good communicator. Effective communication is the key in any relationship. Be clear and honest in your communication and be willing to listen to other people's perspective. Be kind and respectful. Treat the other person with kindness and respect. Small gestures like holding doors open and offering compliments can go a long way. Plan thoughtful dates. Plan dates that are tailored to the other person's interests and preferences. This shows you are invested in getting to know them and making them feel special. Remember, every person is unique and there is no one size fits all approach to dating. It is important to be yourself and treat the other person with kindness and respect. Good luck. Well, Charlie, there you have it. Just like what your mother used to say. Okay, Jonathan. Uh, come on up, Jonathan. Let's hear your question. Yeah, because I think it's going to be a little easy. I got it. I got a, a No, no, that that that'll. Yeah. We'll we'll uh we'll we'll ask it a question later. Right. Go ahead, Jonathan. My question is: If artificial intelligence is able to accomplish various tasks to be uh, more time efficient, cost effective, reduce travel needs, and are convenient for us to use for many other reasons, does that then mean that we have reached the point in history? where we can focus on uh, pure education and hobbies, artistic interests, organizing pursuits, and enjoy a high quality of life so jobs are no longer necessary and still maintain a high quality of life for the majority of the population on Earth. Thank you for your answer. 
You know, Jonathan, um, to be honest with you, I think the best answer to that question is what uh, a television pioneer said when he was developing television. I think there was his name, uh, come on, come on. Who invented television? Logie Bird. I'm going to get this in real quick. All right, here we go. Uh, no, it's uh, Joe Louis Bar. Oh, God, I didn't have this stuff anyway. Farnsworth is the guy I'm thinking of. Philo Key Farnsworth. Farnsworth. Yes, he was the guy who invented uh, television in, in his teens and he. he later on to invent the electron gun, the orthicon, and the whole thing in 1926. And his hope was that it would educate the world. His hope was that it would help, you know, bring the world together through communication instantaneously. Yeah. Well, in the eight, 90 years of TV that we saw, we also heard in the 1960s that it was called the vast wasteland of all the people coming in. However, there have been some bright spots like you know, we've seen the development of the public broadcasting system, yeah. programs like Sesame Street. Uh, and now today, even with um, the development of the internet, there are several content creators out there that you can almost find anything you want. And in regards to AI, what it's just basically going to do with human beings is it's going to help, um, help get in a lot more tools to do it. Now, take, for example, um, you know, video production has gotten a lot easier and a lot more professionalized that a fifth grader now has the power of what a television producer had 20 years ago. What you're seeing is maybe a lot of amateurish videos, but you're also seeing those same people who are talented in the field giving you some very high quality stuff. And what AI is going to do is also enhance that ability to go in. Now, like, say, for example, there's a guy out who right now who did a completely uh, AI generated movie based on a script that he uploaded. It, up, it got the, the things and everything else. Here, for example, uh, let's just say, uh, write me a story. Write me a story about Charlie and capitalism. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see what chat TV is. Once upon a time, there was a man who who named Charlie who lived in a small town. Charlie had always been fascinated by the concept of capitalism and the idea that of uh, being his own boss. He had a dream of starting his own business and making a name for himself in the world of commerce. Despite not having much money, okay, I'm sorry. Despite despite not having much money, Charles was determined to make his dream a reality. He started small, selling handmade goods at local markets and fairs. His products are unique and of high quality, and he soon gained a lawyer customer base. As his business grew, Charlie realized that he needed to expand his operations in order to keep up with the demand. He invested his profits back into the business, buying new equipment, hiring employees to help with production. As you can see, Charlie, this comes on more and more about your story. But, uh, you know, the thing is, it can be used for almost anything. And, uh, you know, as a trends in society come in, you know, you know, another one is atomic power <laughs> that we've all got a lot about. You know, uh, when we nuclear power can be used to make energy or make bombs, we also have the problems of nuclear waste. I'm an advocate of the thorium smolten salt reactor. I think it's a good thing. Other people think it should be banned. And artificial intelligence and the tools that are making it, they're coming. They're not gonna be stopped. Uh, there's a whole bunch of news about it and all you gotta do is, uh, not all of it because it, 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 you know, remember the web is a worldwide phenomenon. If we don't do it, somebody else will. Uh, it, Ellen, Ellen, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get up into the rebuttal period in a few minutes, okay? All right. Okay. But like anything else, it's a tool. It's a neutral tool. What you put to it is good or bad. 
sometimes things we should be doing are good. Sometimes things we can't be doing should not be done that badly. But I wish I could. Yeah, I know it's echoing, so I I don't know how to stop that myself at this point. Huh? I think that's a good idea. I, th I think it's a good idea. What? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I think I think my mom is right, and I think it's about time we go into rebuttals. Okay. Well, a lot everybody is self-enforced five minutes. Um, again, we're going to alternate between Zoom, and uh, I'm going to stop the screen sharing here. We'll alternate between the Zoom. Raise your hand. Uh, we'd like to see you on the screen. So I'm going to start here now with uh, Ellen. And she's got her hand up. Ellen, we'll give you five or six minutes and say you'll probably have to come up here to be seen on camera if you can, okay? So go ahead, Ellen, and I'm going to take your time and uh, do what you need to do, Ellen. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tim. And this is an important subject and a controversial one. I'm glad you're bringing it up. And you know, I, it's, I used to be a teacher. I studied the philosophy of education. And then I, I have an MBA in marketing and e-commerce and uh, wanted developed a business plan for a virtual education city. And the whole thing was, it was, I developed it with a Chinese guy. It's to be a platform, like in Second Life, it should be a tool for teachers, but what the world has come to is it's a tool for Microsoft. I actually, when I, I love, I'm a student. It should be a tool like a student to student tool, uh, you know, where you could go into the second life and all the documentaries you ever wanted to see, all the complete subject matter, like a liberal arts education. Uh, you could have access to teachers, like I guess, like Thomas Friedman said. Um, you know, but there's got to be two sides to the debate. There has to be a fair and balanced discussion of the issues, like the Federal Communication Commission, the Fairness Doctrine. What, sadly and horribly and frighteningly and horrifyingly. The CIA has been covert operations ever since 1948 has been infiltrated but into our education, into our media, Operation Mockingbird. And they started the internet, you know, Al Gore was right, DARPA. And so it's actually being run by the Department of War, now called the Department of Defense. And it is a, the cyber warfare is, um, you know, with 9-11, which they coordinated through the internet, they, we, we know all this from investigative journalists, the prosecutor management information system was stolen in 1981 by the Reagan administration, going back to the Bush crime family. And they just made it into a targeting intelligence enabled to them to they you know go after the guerrillas in Vietnam and then Colombia and Argentina and manage the dirty wars. And so this is the truth of who we are. Jan said that, you know, it's who who are we? Who we are is this is an invisible imperialist Nazi empire run by literally Hitler's head of intelligence, Reinhard Gellin, uh, collaborating with NATO, Operation Gladio. And, and so, you know, it, it sounds good. If you didn't know any of this, it might sound like a, you know, a happy story. But once you know this, you realize how dangerous it is. We've got, you know, cyber warfare, biological warfare, uh, chemical warfare, with, you know, and they censor those of us who are speaking critically about it. And it's overt now. You can't say that B word. Watch Jimmy, go, you know, Jimmy Dore. 
he he can bring on critical voices, but then he ends it saying, and the vaccine is safe and effective, knowing that if he doesn't say that, he's removed. Like I've been removed from LinkedIn. I've been removed from being able to talk about it, this college of complexes. I've been removed from, you know, when you've been, John F. Kennedy, you know, said he's been censored for 13 years because he happened to read the science on the reality of the way mercury and nanoparticles, which were developed as bioweapons, you know, create spike proteins that lodge in the brain and the ovaries and the placentas and are making us into uh, dumbed down and infertile people. So it, we, we have to re-regulate everything, rightfully re-regulate, put the fairness doctrine the FCC back in. Right now, we don't even know that we're being run by this globalist, American globalist group that, you know, it's, um, there are no regulations. That started with Citizens United, that they, they're like, if an institution is, a corporation is a person too, but the reality is, organizations and institutions and governments, we needed to regulate them. That's why we had a constitution. And right now they're like, oh no, we're people. But none of our laws obviously apply. You can't have a death penalty for a for a government, you know? And we need to denazify. I'm, I'm running for the chief of police. I've been to the meetings. You have to talk to the people and warn them that, that to pick another chief of police, their one algorithm that, that they're putting into their artificial intelligence is don't let Ellen tell, don't let her get anywhere near there because she'll try to open the records and look and see if the, who are the police crimes torturing the people. Oh, that's another subject I wasn't allowed to talk about here. They censor out the crimes of the state. That's the problem. It's a complete, total censorship machine that's what got us into nazi germany and it's what's gotten us back in there this time it's more dangerous because it's invisible thank you all right our next hunter please all right Sigma. yeah just do it please all right uh i just saw you you can see it might be interesting get up there no, it's all right. It's all right. So we're going to get a microphone next to you here real quick. All right. Speak into the mic and then uh, go ahead and uh, just say your piece. Well, I was reading an article about artificial intelligence and also planning. And they say um, the internet and all that is very good for planning. Now, in the Soviet Union, it went down in uh, 1991. And they said one of the reasons it did this because if you couldn't figure out exactly what the five year plans were, were going to do, and with um, all these new technical advances. It can be done relatively easily. Otherwise, you got to spend a lot of people doing it, and it takes a long time before you finish it. So, with this new technology, it can be done a lot faster. Now, as far as um, other things are concerned. We know, for instance, when they captured Che Guevara in Bolivia, <laughs> they had new technology. The technology was to get a number of people together, especially in the jungle. With this new technology, they, they were able to see exactly where the gorillas were in Bolivia. And that's the way we got Che Guevara. So 
Fabrice can be used for something positive or something negative. For instance, if somebody gets lost in the jungle, there's plane crash. You know, if there's enough people there, they can spot it. Things of that nature. So it has its good side and probably its bad side. And some people say, well, we don't have enough jobs. And the job that we have now will be taken away and be superfluous. Superfluous. But with this new technology, there's always new jobs coming in. I got it. To take its place. Plus, if we had a rational type of economy, we could cut the hours and, the job and put people more, more people more through what through what hours for them to make the profits. So they're not interested. They're only interested in making profits. And if we do this, like like um, the ball player, what's that? Go to market. Hey, I'll any time on that because there's so little people that have it, they can't make profit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who would like to go next now? Yeah, they're not trying to solve this easy. Okay. Who would like to go next? Do we have anybody? I can go if you want to. Okay, uh, Raj, we'll let you go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello. This is a, hello, this is Raj Patel. Uh, when internet came, and there were lots of hope about it. And uh, we accomplished a lot. But uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, it seems that average person loses and those who have knowledge and power in the technology, they gain, they control us. And uh, no matter what we do, the Artificial intelligence doesn't create a new knowledge. It just processes the knowledge and uh, it can help businesses or manufacturing or management. But for average person, he understands less about how to use it or how to manage the, uh, their, their prescription or uh, talking to doctor, everything. It's a still doctor is in charge. And uh, he decides what you what you are. It's still uh, if you go to pharmacy, pharmacy is in charge. You know, they, 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 we have limitations. We cannot we cannot change pharmacy on a what is daily cost of the thing because uh, it's complicated. You go to a doctor has to send a prescription and all those things happen. So uh, the artificial intelligence, I think for for the time being. It's not going to do any good to average person, and may, I may be wrong, but uh, it, it's a, it's about creative people. It will be nice. For a Zoom, some people make lots of money and some people don't. On a, on a, on a, uh, Twitter, it's the same thing. The smart people are going to be ahead. They will be in charge. But average person, you know, who doesn't know much about this thing, it's just like I bought a cell phone and it's, I bought. With all the all the things, but I, I was such a difficulty in programming and managing it. It's just almost impossible. I use simple phone, and sometimes I don't use that even. So I I do not know. I mean, uh, what where where this thing evolves, and if uh, it helps, it's no good. This is no good. That there's a trick or a, it it does a magic of doing something, solving some problem at a high level, or it streamlines the the employee efficiency or streamlines uh, the, the products and process, fine. Those things are good. But still, workers are going to gain or workers are going to be more controlled by the boss, manufacturer. 
okay and it is very much doubtful to me that the, the, the artificial intelligence can do do the thing which average person's happiness can be achieved and uh, there is lots of debate about this thing but uh, are we leading to a brave new world and uh, where we, we can have pleasure and everything, but we do not have control over our life. We can be beautiful, we can enjoy the life, but we are more like a robot that, that is living human creature. We are not human, we are robot. Thank you. Thank you, I'm done. Please. Okay, uh, Charlie, you want to go next? Um, Charlie, if you're ready, go ahead. Yeah, all right. Go. Thanks a lot, Tim, for a very nice presentation. And well put together. Or should I thank the machine who did it? <laughs> I've got to cover four things very quickly. Number one, uh, that section on the College of Complexes, I was impressed by that. Now I've seen just about anything and everything that was written about the College of Complexes. And I have no idea where the machine got that. It is well written. I'd like to get a copy of it, in fact, and post it on our website. Tim, if you could kind of do that for me, I'd appreciate it. But I'm singularly amazed that I've never seen any of that any of those passages in print or written as eloquently as they were. That's number one. Number two. Um, I was fascinated. I gave a lecture on UFOs, identified flying objects. I watched a documentary on the history of UFOs in the United States. It was an hour and a half program. It began in 1947 when Kenneth Arnold first time saw UFOs. And it was only later, it was an excellent documentary. I said, wow, this is really well done. It had a narrator and so forth. The entire documentary was produced and illustrated, and the commentator, the narrator, all, all were done by AI, the entire thing. I said, this is just incredible. But it gave one episode after another in an orderly fashion with illustrations and, and a commentator there on the screen talking uh, in between each segment. Okay. Number three, yes, television was originally intended to be an educational device. Uh, WTGW used to have actually courses, very many courses they would have uh, online. They've gotten away from it. They got into general programming. Uh, the college I attended had a TV set in every classroom. I was always amazed about that, but it was the building was built at the time and they thought televisions were going to be an educational tool for instruction. Last of all, I want to talk about the misconceptions of the fairness doctrine. And I highly recommend that if you talk about a topic, you look it up and get some knowledge of it. You don't take a term. The fairness doctrine was something back in like 1948 when there were only three networks. And they said, let's try to achieve balanced coverage. The idea was not to have one of the networks function as Fox News does today. It somewhat made sense then. And there were some efforts. As a matter of fact, initially, there were some total idiots who managed to get on TV as a result, and they put an end to that right away, um, as it was applied. But it made point when the media, you had like three networks. Well, guess what? We no longer have three networks. As a matter of fact, anyone who gets cable, you have 1,000 channels. And if you add in the internet, you have a virtual infinity of news outlets. Now, to try to apply the fairness doctrine, to all of those, no, you have the option. Our choices are not limited anymore. You have nothing to do if you choose to have another media outlet 
than to press a key or to use your mouse. So the fairness doctrine has no application whatsoever given the current technology of the media. And it gets less and less every single day. People have cell phones and so forth. They're not restricted to three evening news shows. So get that out of the way. That's what it had. Now, also, the fair you take a term, you say, oh, well, if I get out, I say the moon is made of green cheese. Doesn't mean I can demand that if there's a show on astronomy, that I be given a segment to present on it. That's not an application of Ernest Doctrine. News outlets are not obligated. They're obligated only to the point of striving to achieve objective truth. All right. Not everything under the sun. Same thing with a public library. I'm almost done. A public library tries to put the very best books on the shelves with accurate information. Public librarians are not obligated to put nonsense on the shelf. So let's let's use this term appropriately. And I'm not under no obligation by law to listen to a guy who tells me that the moon is made of green cheese. Thank you. All right, uh, Justin, are you ready to give your rebuttal? Your hands up. Yes. Um, All right, like Justin, to uh, I'm going to give you a lower your hand. You've got the floor. Hopefully, we can so, see. So uh, they actually put a lot of fake nonsense into the libraries. It's called fiction. And it's a good chunk of library collections. So uh, libraries do, in fact, put nonsense in there. Um, You're calling good literature nonsense? A great and uh, while we're at it, I would like to further um, come on how the, the College of Complexes uh, lack of moderation is affecting the quality of the programming. Um, so, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, Charlie just interrupted me when I'm talking. He should know better. Yeah. Yeah. The only and he's going to do it again right now. Okay. Let's uh, keep going. And also, uh, you know, there's, there's ways you have a, you have a zoom here that has administrative settings. You can set the settings in a manner that will cut down on the trolls that get in here and interrupt. It's very easy. All you got to do is just make register, uh, you know, people who join the call have a registered email address. We did that uh, with the LP Chicago and we haven't had trolls show up since. So I would highly encourage um, the moderators to employ the technology to cut down on the trolls that come in and interrupt. Um, but uh, I guess that's really all I got. Thanks. I'll suck it up. Did you want to do something, uh, Calvin? No, no, I'm fine. All right, uh, Lance, we, I, you're, it's your first time here in a while. You want to say something? Lance, anything? You want to unmute and say anything in a rebuttal? I guess not. Who else has got something to say? Okay, go ahead. We'll, get, we'll go back to our... Uh, uh, on, yeah, I got them all there. We're all set. What about the So it looks like the conclusion that we should draw is that AI can be used for good or for evil, just like a lot of tools. And um, I think what the AI admitted about itself is that it's if it's trained in order to have a bias, then it will it will continue having a bias. So we need to train it to do good and to train it to be unbiased and to be objective. So neutral, um, which the media should be as well. So I just want to talk about two concerns associated with AI, not that I wish to blame any particular program. And uh, I don't, I didn't catch who created this open AI. I guess, Elon, Maybe I guess Elon Musk was on the board. Uh, not for a little while. Now, yeah. I, well, sure. No. So 
one problem, the uh, potential concern involving AI is that, that people might use it for academic dishonesty to generate papers. And there's enough academic dishonesty already going around yeah. that it doesn't mean it's not a concern. And I don't know, I don't have any expertise in this area. But another thing, in 2020, New York Times, ACLU, and a couple other publications released articles saying that a man in Detroit uh, was accused by an algorithm wrongly. And uh, the Detroit police are using predictive policing to try to figure out who's going to, uh, they're trying to predict criminal recidivism. There's an article from ACLU saying wrongfully arrested because face recognition can't tell black people apart. And like, you know, I, like I said, I don't wish to blame chatai.com for that, but that's some of the risks I think we have to be worried about when it comes to automatically, you know, generated algorithms. Now that there's not human algorithms, human generated algorithms like the YouTube patent, um, which is, you know, YouTube came out in 05 or 06, but not a lot of people know. I'm sorry, this is a total tangent, but uh, the original patent for YouTube, which became YouTube, uh, was patented back in 2001 by a man named Mark Collins Rector, who was a child abuser who was fled to Belgium. And that could explain a lot of the censorship um, and leniency toward child abuse videos that's happening on uh, YouTube and associated platforms right now. So that's the most direct comments I have related to AI. I hope that was relevant. Thanks for listening. Okay, who's next? Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm from Texas. Um, I have a question We have a couple more people coming up for rebutting. Um, the only thing I have to say, which is really short, um, I was talking to a person about my age, probably about 20 years ago. And um, we were talking about um, television and I think it was probably during, maybe it was more than 20, when television was described as a vast wasteland. And um, we were talking about the origins of television. And this guy had been to a Catholic school. And um, he said that um, his, the nuns in his school were just ecstatic when television first came out. And I remember that, unfortunately. I do remember when television first came out. And they were saying, <laughs> You're not that old, but anyway. So, so um, okay. I got distracted. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> but anyway, what we what what we were talking about was uh, the fact that in his Catholic school, the nuns were saying, "This is going to be the most wonderful thing. It will be so great for education." And it's, but television was not developed for education. It was developed to sell products, and that's what it. That does is it sells or back in the day when it was really popular, when there were actually three um, networks that was what it was for it was to sell products it was not developed for education and um, had it been developed for education things would be a lot different in the world now than they are because uh, but, but um, the money went into making more money and it wasn't, did the money did not go into education, it went into selling. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, who's next? Jonathan, you gotta hear from our, we have to hear from our resident poet laureate. Uh, Come on, come on up here, Jonathan. We're, we're, we're waiting for you. And in the meantime, we'll get, I gotta get this camera angled on him because he is taller than I am. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thanks, Tim, for an interesting talk about a really good subject. Uh, when I think about AI, I ask myself, are we going to have a higher quality of life during its use on Earth? 
are we going to have self-determination on earth because that'll determine how it's used and uh have an impact on less worry that we'll have whose hands it's in and what's their state of mind uh to most want to use it uh, are we able at this point to plan the structure of it in our communities um, are there places we can have public dialogue and have a discourse that's healthy and honest and transparent to decide uh, where do we definitely not want it to be applied where do we what areas do we definitely want it to be applied those are important questions um, how will it decrease or increase waste, fraud, and abuse? That's a, a big uh, question of concern for me. Um, technology and ways of making the way we operate in business more time efficiently uh, is always a concern in the financial services industry as we know. Are we able to determine the, the limits of its use, especially in the ways that past technologies have traditionally been used to hurt instead of help? So uh, is it gonna increase profit in the areas of ecocide? Is it gonna increase profit in the areas of war? Is it gonna increase profit in the areas of divide and conquer? Is it gonna increase profits in the areas of slavery? Is it gonna increase profits in the areas of propaganda? Is it gonna increase profits in the area of secrecy? Is it gonna increase profits in the areas of oppression? Is it gonna increase profits in the area of injustice? Uh, these are questions that the public uh, we, dis we discuss amongst ourselves, we don't have a official dialogues in every country to uh, set our legislators on a clear path where they represent our values and they are the servants of the people's will as opposed to us just immediately having to obey and accept what they have deemed it's gonna be, uh, which more often than not happens without the media even mentioning that that is what's happening in real time. So you have a lot of corporate media who doesn't even say, well, wait a second, Congress shouldn't have made that declaration or that announcement. We didn't even have a national dialogue on that very important big ticket thing that should take several years of local, regional and national uh, hashing it all out and getting into all of the details of what's involved in it with the people who know best how uh, it's gonna be used, how it's gonna be implemented, how it can be used against our will. Um, it's a tool like any other tool, like many people have said. So it will be used for constructive use when people have communities of self-determination and when we have communities where our government just announces that our time and trust and our treasure will go to what the ruling class decides as opposed to what we the people's values clearly are and that's their job. They're supposed to know our values and if they don't, then they should slam on the brakes or whatever they're trying to fast track. Good luck in our lifetimes trying to find out when that's ever happened where they have slammed on the brakes in several key areas. Uh, I'd be interested to hear a talk on that rare occurrence. I'm certain that we should be very wary of people in positions of power when they say that this will be used in areas of space exploration. I'm certain that we should be very wary, not panicking, not uh, scaremongering, not alarmist, just very wary when they say they're going to use it in areas of energy, especially nuclear energy. When they say they're going to use it in law enforcement or prison management or transportation with ships, planes, trains, buses, taxis, be very wary. In areas of elections, in areas of medical use or agriculture, 
in areas of military use? These are some of the questions that I have, and I'm sure many of us have, that we will not allow the legislature to act like a king or an emperor or a supreme lifetime appointed ruler and tell us how it's gonna be, they will engage with us in civic discussions all over the world and then come to the conclusions because that's democracy and we're, uh, we're democracy is at heart. We are not oligarchs or plutocrats or overseers or privatizers or militarists or imperialists at heart. Our natural state are free-minded human beings and whatever intelligence we have on earth, the heart and soul should be we the people's intelligence and the tools should be what we use on the margins, not at the soul of who we are. Thank you, Tim, for a great talk. All right. Andy. Um, Andy, do you want to rebut real quick? Yeah. Come on up. We're ready for you. And we want to thank you. Yeah, for money. Money. yeah okay. he's got all that set. In the meantime, while we're waiting for Andy, um, I am just going to briefly uh, go over real quick. If you like what you saw tonight on ChatGPT, um, it is real easy to get to. Um, I'm going to show my screen real quick and just show you how as soon as I get a chance here. Um, all you got to do is I'll get, I'll get a, I'll, uh, I'll share it here real quick. Um, what you need to do is just go to open dot AI. I think it's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, chat dot open dot com. And once it goes there, you will see real quick that it can, uh, it opens up an account, but what you'll see is if I go out of it, which I'll do now, um, actually what I'll do is I'll open up a, another incognito window here, show you what it looks like when it's not uh, encrypted. So if you give me a second, please. As soon as, we get a, I mean, as, soon as I get a new, uh, boy, am I having a lot of trouble with the technology tonight. This is crazy. Uh, anyway, um, what, 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 what you do is just go to chat.openai.com. All you'll have to do, like with most sites, just give them an email address and a password, open up, and then just look around and start using it. And like anything else, you can have as much fun as we did here tonight by uh, showing what it's all about. All right, Dave, uh, if there are no other rebuttals from the audience or the uh, thing. Andy. Andy, I'm sorry. Yes, Andy, please go ahead. My apologies. To speak into this mic. Yeah, everything. Okay, I'd like to add a few things. Thank you, Tim, for a really enlightening discussion on artificial intelligence. And uh, for those of you that haven't seen these movies. Uh, there's there's two that talk about computer generated images. One was called Looker, L O O K E R, made in 1981. L O O K E R, Looker, that stands for Light Oriented Ocular Something uh, Computer Generated Images, where they uh, a, 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 a model will stand on a pedestal in a dark room and it just turns in a computer flashes, takes images, uh, all kinds of images. And then after that, the computer can generate the movements of the model selling soap suds or whatever it is where normal human models aren't perfect, but they, this, the computer was made for this. And the second movie is called Simone with Al Pacino made in 2002. It's a story of a an actress that dropped out of a movie halfway into production and they couldn't replace her. So he replaced her with an, another completely different looking actress 
that's totally computer generated. It's a really, really good movie to show how far you can get with artificial intelligence and fooling people. And of course, by 1980, the nuclear power industry has learned that once systems get beyond a certain level of complexity, supposedly run by uh, computers that monitor the sensors and everything, there's no way to accurately plan for what kind of accidents you could happen. We had Chernobyl, we had Fukushima, we had Three Mile Island. Uh, Three Mile Island wasn't a total meltdown just because it was blind luck. Anyway, there's a movie that, uh, talking about, well, all of the Terminator movies talk about Skynet and uh, the computer intelligence in the future trying to get rid of the human infestation on the planet. That's what they refer to. And Star Trek had a classic where they encountered this alien probe called Nomad. And Nomad was flying through the, you know, various, uh, our, our galaxy sterilizing worlds and getting rid of the human infestations, biological infestations or what, what it was called. If, if there's no, nobody or no human intelligence with, what, what we call a gut reaction, our instinct, that to just look at the big picture and say, that can't be right, that doesn't feel right. The classic example is in war games, 1983. You know, they, they're in the war room at, at NORAD and, and, the, and the, all of the bells and whistles go off and says, well, we think there's 3000 missiles coming over the poles, but we can't be sure. And so they ride it out and they find out it was a computer generated attack. but. The movie War Games, what it portrayed, people don't know, <clears throat> that was real in the summer of 87. Gorbachev and Reagan, the two sides, were overriding the computers that wanted to launch World War III because each side thought they were under attack. That was the year that there were so many UFOs flying through the radar screens of both countries, setting them off like a pinball machine. And by 1988, the CIA had a secret program tracking the other four civilizations in their spacecraft and they're well they're, they're called spacecraft when the air in the air when they're under the water going down to 20,000 feet to a suspected basis on the bottom of the ocean they're called underwater unidentified objects ships captains have been reporting these things you know from the time of Columbus the time they had ships that would fly across deep water sail across deep waters they call, uh, there's a book called Invisible Residents, the residents that we share the planet with. They were reporting these underwater things. They come up near a ship and they look like a whale coming up initially out of the water. And then when they come up fully out of the water and take a lap around the ship and fly off at 3000 miles an hour, you know, it wasn't a whale. And the, our Navy has been tracking these things since 1970 with, uh, sonar that can track deep down in the water. So there is a lot going on that could be confused by artificial intelligence that doesn't, doesn't have a human perception, a gut reaction of what, does this look right? And in, in, within the Reagan years, there was a classic cartoon with um, a sonar operator, you know, uh, reporting that um, there, there was something Cartoon, anyway, um, the captain standing behind him, he says, what, what, do we know what this means? He says, yeah, sailor, open the portal and take a peek. Don't count on your computer screens for what they're telling you where our ship's under attack. Just open the window and take a look. And that's common sense, but that's lost by a lot of technologists that they think the latest and greatest technology is cat's meow. Well, in, in my industry, I've been, we spent the last 10 years in the heating and air conditioning business telling people to avoid at all costs, if you can, furnaces and air conditioners that have computer boards in it. Because they're, they're, you can't troubleshoot them. You have to, if you have any little microchip fails, there goes $800 down the toilet. That's why they sell them. They're 2% more efficient, but they make gobs of money on repair parts. And these net, uh, and for those of you that 
might have a thermostat that you can talk to with your smartphone. Other people can talk to that thermostat like our hackers on the internet. We've had people install a new furnace, smart thermostat, you know, they can check how their house is doing from miles away. But if they forget to check while they're out in Las Vegas on vacation, they come back to a house that froze solid as a brick. Because if you have a power failure, they don't tell you that you gotta, if, if it's off for a day, you gotta unplug that thermos, take it off the wall and charge it with a cell phone charger because it won't come back on when time its power comes back on like a normal thermostat. And those things are economically unserviceable. There's no, uh, no switches on them or anything else. It's just a glorified transistor radio they sell for $500, $600 installed. But we don't think houses should be web enabled for that reason because anybody can hack in and check what's going on in your house, check, you know, you check the sump pump, shut it off, uh, turn the heat up to 100 degrees or shut it off all together. You have that capability, your vulnerability with a web-enabled thermostat, right? So, the technology has to be overseen by human people with a human brain that uh, can, and a, a lot of times it's not a brain processing all kinds of information. It's an instinct, a gut reaction. Nobody can explain it. Well, the, the best example is identical twins. When one of them falls down and breaks an arm in California, the other one here in, here in Illinois will feel the pain in the same arm right away. Biological radiation uh, travels hundreds of miles instantaneously. You know, animals can sense this. Can somebody keep in time. Uh, Justin, we're going to about guys. We got plenty of time. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate your update. So I, I, I was just getting ready to finish up before Justin pointed out that uh, we, we have a time limit. We still have 20 minutes to go, incidentally, and not many other people here sitting through. So um, again, thanks for the presentation. And we should all keep a sharp eye on the ad advances of artificial intelligence. But those movies, Looker, Simone, War Games, are all very entertaining. Thank you. Uh, Enemy of the State is another one. Social credit scores Okay, are there any more people wanting to rebut? Social credit scores, how they can track you. Okay, seeing there's no rebuttals left, we're gonna close out with uh, David Zucker. So David, come on up and close us out. I, I really like to see the horse, but... Where do we get to? He's not. You're the closeout speaker, Tim. Uh, I, I, he's going to. Tim, you're the closeout. Hang on, Raj. What you what you want what you want to say, Raj? Uh, I want to ask a question. Is anybody had ever use uh, artificial intelligence in their anything practical? For anything practical? Yeah. Um. Hang on. Anybody? Uh, yeah. Raj, artificial intelligence, first off, you just look at web search alone, it's a very practical thing to do it because you've seen what chat GPT does with the natural language responses. Uh, just imagine that with some hyperlinks and some other web-based queries and a, a tied to a search engine like Bing or Google, which is exactly what they're doing now because Microsoft is coming out with something called BARD, B-A-R-D and it's gonna be tied to their search engine. Right now, it's still in the developmental phase, but in the next few weeks, you're gonna be seeing it come out. Um, as far as like a port or something right now, uh, they're being used all over the world already to, for like containerized shipping for the best outcomes, uh, you know, which is basically, you know, fuel optimization and all kinds of things like that. There's a ton of practical uses for artificial intelligence. Anyway, with that, uh, I'm done speaking. I'm gonna let Dave close us out, then we'll get out of here. Okay, so so let's point that piece. Should all right, we'd like to thank point. all of you for coming. Uh, let's thank our speaker, Tim Bolger.
Next week, as Charlie explained earlier, our program is going to be a special May Day speaker, a communist celebration of May Day with Fred Kushner. I hope you can all be here. Thank you for coming. See you next week. And we stand adjourned. Charlie, I'm going to flip you over for the uh, continuation. I'm going to make you host and we're going to log out of here. Stop recording. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Justin.